<laughs> yeah, hi, I'm Aisa Tamaiga. I work at Vero Systems. I'm Henrik Alseer. I work at UCS Guru. And we are going to talk about uh, embedded Rust, how to get started and how to have great fun with it. So without further ado, so what you can expect, there will be some preaching, of course. I mean, it's a Rust conference, everybody loves Rust, but we're still going to try to sell it to you. But in an embedded context, um, yeah. Then we will talk a bit about hardware and how to set up your home lab. Uh, how you will choose how to choose a platform, uh, the ecosystem around every platforms, how to actually start with Rust Embedded. The most important thing is going to come near the end, troubleshooting, because, yeah, debugging and all those stuff, and then great questions, and this is going to be your job as an audience. Okay, yeah, so I guess I'll do the preaching to the choir here. Um, yeah, we're not really here to teach you about Rust. I guess most of you are here because you already know this is a really, really cool language. So we just wanted to highlight some aspects of it that makes it a really good fit for embedded development. Uh, yeah, so I won't bore you with all the de you know, details you already know about safety and how it prevents data races and so on. And uh, we also have the unsafe keyword to, for all the Hold my beer, I know what I'm doing situations. Uh, but yeah, the most important part of this, um, or, or one aspect that is really cool, is the ability to make a hardware agnostic uh, code that we can run on, on different hardware. Uh, so we can use, do a very uh, portable and reusable. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, build a portable and reusable ecosystem. The most important or the coolest part about Rust is also the tooling that we have available or embedded. Uh, on an honorable mention is the Nerling uh, project. There is an open source tooling project for embedded systems that provides, for example, a really great app template that you can use as a starting point to get, get started really fast on your project. We also have like the format, logging, and probe RS, etc. And we can also utilize the rest of the Rust ecosystem uh, and use this in our, in our embedded systems as well. So, uh, what, so what's this is an embedded system. <clears throat> uh, it's an integrated compu computing system with a dedicated purpose. It's designed to do like one thing really well. Um, and it can also be part of a bigger system where multiple small systems uh, work together. Uh, and what makes it different from other types of development in Rust. Uh, for one thing, we, we have very constrained devices. We're working with, with very limited performance in terms of memory and computation power. Uh, our use cases are usually very hard on real-time constraints. So we need like, very deterministic performance in the time domain. We often have low power requirements because we might be running from battery or solar power. Um, yeah, and we usually operate without an operating system, which presents its own, own set of challenges. So examples of embedded systems is uh, yeah, all electronic devices you see around you probably contain some kind of embedded systems. For example, like elevators, rockets, bridges, you know, they run Spotify these days. <laughs> and uh, yeah, blinky Christmas lights. And yeah, even pregnancy tests these days run an embedded system. 
You see the happy face of this woman is probably because laying doom, <coughs> laying doom on this stick. So, yeah, oh, we're going to talk about uh, the hardware in Home Lab. So it's really uh, addictive, it's really fun to build. I, I'm a maker, and what happens after a while is, yeah, you start collecting things, and I was showing my collection to, to my husband, and he very lovely said, oh, this is so cute, it looks like the Predator and his trophies. And, and when we compare, yeah, there was... There is some similarities. So, yeah, so hardware. So you usually have um, um, yeah, inputs and outputs. So usually it's sensors and outputs are actuators. And the processing part is done on the, on the board, on the development board. And uh, so this is a, from Fritzing, a software that everybody used to, to show connect connections. And prototyping these days is, is, is quite easy. It's like Lego, you just buy parts and you put them together. So it's pretty cheap and accessible. And um, uh, most of dev boards include a lot of options. They include usually sensor LEDs, um, a lot of stuff that you display, stuff that you will need, stuff that you will not need. Uh, they also have very often a debug probe. And this is something that allows you to flash the program on, the, on your board. Uh, to debug it, to log through it. Uh, it's often powered through USB, but some boards have also uh, batteries. And why do you use a dev board? It's really good for prototyping, it's good for a proof of concept, um, but it's also, there is also a lot of stuff that you don't need, so it can be uh, expensive in power and money, because a lot of stuff. So yeah, hardware, what you need to, to get started, you, you need uh, the dev board, a logic analyzer to watch the signal that are sent, a multimeter to see if things are connected or check the voltage. Um, then this little thing, USB UART adapter, can be very useful to see your board in the USB port. Uh, cables and resistors, a beginner kit is working fine and uh, yeah, soldering tools, a soldering station, and, and some soldering tools. And friend told me to say how much all this costs. So at this point of the game, you can say goodbye to uh, 70, 100 -ish, uh, euros. It's not the cheapest uh, hobby. But at some point, you are going to be an adult and a grown-up, and you will want to design things that you will want to, to sell, maybe. And at this stage, yeah, you might need SMDs or not the dev board anymore, just the, just the chip. And uh, yeah, at that part, you will need, I don't know, signal generators, uh, PSUs to, to put exactly the voltage that you want, uh, oscilloscope, microscopes. And so this is not something that I priced because, yeah, this is, uh, depends on the quality and stuff. So um, how to choose? what platform you're going to get started on here. There are a lot of different options. So um, I usually say that the best microcontroller you can choose is probably the one you used in a previous project, because usually there's a lot of gotchas and ins and outs of these devices that you get to learn once you work on a project. So yeah, probably the one you used before is a good one to start with. Um, so, but if you have, like, getting started and you have a project in mind, you can look for a dev board with a, that have these integrated on the board sensors and stuff that you might want to use for your project to get started quickly. Also, it's very important to, to choose something with full documentation and schematics and stuff available because it will make your life easier. And uh, also a good idea to go with something maybe slightly bigger than you really need because you can reuse it for future projects. Also last but not least you need something that has good rust support. So choose something with 
where you can find a lot of good examples and that has a good uh, ecosystem around it. So yeah, Tata will tell us about it, the examples of this. Yes. The ecosystems? So the, uh, like a colleague always joke on that, that ROS support is excellent as long as you stay in um, Cortex-M. And this is, this is true, we're working on it, but uh, it's still true. So the lion's share is, is um, STM32 and NRF52. Uh, there have been many years in the ma making, so I took those examples. Uh, at Ferro System, we have training material on NRF52, 840. And uh, the, also, uh, there is a book called the Discovery Book. It was made on STM32 F3 Discovery Board, but it's sold out probably over predators out there. So our colleagues rewrote the whole book for uh, Microbit, which is also an RF52. So to get started, you, you can use that. Um, and yeah, uh, the new uh, RP2040 Raspberry Pi is also uh, ARM Cortex M0. They have great hauls, great tutorials, great example that you can start to, to, get, set, to get set up. And uh, there is the Rust embedded matrix as well which is a community that you can join. Then the new hotness risk five. So uh, Espressif, we have been working a lot with Espressif at Ferro Systems to produce um, training material. So they have uh, this board that is made ex explicitly for Rust. It's called the ESP32C3 Rust board. Uh, it has something great that um, other boards not usually support. It supports Rust STD. It has also a walkway simulator, so if you are impatient for your hardware, you can, you can try the code in the simulator and you, it's going to flash and run. And they also have a, a community. I put the, their matrix address there. And last and not least, if you have uh, great Arduino projects that you would like to port to, to Rust, there is a crate called Averal, so I would like to make a shout out to, to Raix, who was making this community. This community is also growing super fast, so don't throw your Atemega AVR projects on Arduino. You, there is support in Rust, too, for those. Okay. Yeah, so let's look at the basic structure of a Rust embedded program, what it can look like. It's, um, you know, we, um, there's a really neat, um, way to, to set up. You, you use the same build system as in your ordinary Rust development journey, like using Cargo. Just add the compilation target for your processor architecture. And um, yeah, so I won't go into the details of setting up this environment, but it's a really uh, smooth job. So. Uh, we, when we work with a, a microcontroller, we, we work with these memory map peripherals. That means to interact with the hardware, you read and write to, to specific addresses in memory called registers. And um, to help us do this, we have uh, the first la layer of abstraction here called the peripheral access crate. And this is Rust code that is often generated from manufacturers' documentation, so like SVD files that comes in XML format that uh, we can translate to Rust code. But this is usually a very inherently unsafe um, layer to work in because we don't know uh, much about what is uh, uh, good and bad <laughs> on this level. So we usually want to wrap this layer in a, another level of ab abstraction where we can provide a safe API around this uh, peripheral access crate that we call the hardware abstraction layer, the HAL. Uh, so there we can use Rust this type system and borrow checker to enforce correctness. 
And uh, yeah, while all these uh, levels are device specific, like for a specific family of ships, so if we want to build a hardware agnostic ecosystem, we have this trait called embedded HAL that is like a unifying trait that will provide uh, traits that all of these device specific HALs will implement like common functionality that they all use. So we can build drivers that are agnostic to the, the platform we're on. So let's look at the minimal example of what it, the code can look like. This is the hello world of embedded, the Blinky app, just the blinks and LED on your board. That's usually the starting point of any embedded journey. Um, yeah, so just a quick run through of the code here. You see that we tagged the, the file with no STD because we're running on no, no TD um, platform here. Um, we import some dependencies here. The Cortex-MRT uh, is a crate that provides us a minimal runtime and startup code. So this entry macro uh, tells the microcontroller what to do when it's powering up, where it's going to jump to this code. Uh, we also have this HAL, you see there, the hardware abstraction layer that we imported. Um, you can see we use the singleton pattern here to, to make sure that, that we don't have global mutable access to all these uh, hardware registers. We can use the type system and borrow checker to, to uh, so we need to pass around the ownership of this. Uh, register access, so we can't do it ourselves in the foot. Uh, yeah, we need to set up some clocks and stuff. We don't show everything here in the example. Then we also use this uh, GPIO peripherals. It's the pins on the controller that we can have connected to an LED on the board. Uh, and by setting this, um, configure it as a push-pull output. And we can use this uh, hoggle to just set it alternatingly high or low to turn it on or off, wait for a second there. We have this infinite loop running because this main function can never uh, return because then our program would, would end and the microcontroller would shut down. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so we're going to talk about um, some strategies, like basic strategies in embedded systems. So one is pulling, is in that infinite loop that Henrik showed, you are asking your device if it's ready. So if it's 16 megahertz, it means 16 million times a, a second. You're like, are you ready now? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? And it's not a good strategy. It's not irritating for the hardware. But still, it's, it's blocking, uh, and uh, why would you do that? You just do that at the start to make sure that it's a minimal viable example to make sure that you, connect, you can connect with your peripherals and stuff are working. And uh, it's not good as well in, in time-critical systems because, yeah, obviously, uh, you, want, you want that when something happens, um, the, that the system reacts immediately. So, that's why we would use interrupts. So when you are monitoring an event, the hardware will raise a flag. Uh, the flag is going to trigger a callback function on which you are going to act. And then the flag is going to be cleared. And uh, the function that was left is going to be re-entered. So in Rust, you also have uh, OS-ish. I mean, this was bare metal, but you have also OS-ish. You have um, artosis, like uh, you have in C. 
So Zephyr or FreeRTOS are also, I mean, no, we have Talk and Hubris. Uh, it's an operative system that was uh, developed by Oxide as a debugger called Humility. Um, but I mean, you can stay bare metal because there, have, there is excellent runtime libraries, uh, two that we really like, Arctic for preemptive concurrency and Embassy for um, uh, cooper cooperative concurrency. So why were we talking about interrupts? It was uh, mostly to talk about Arctic. So this is my, one of my absolute favorite frameworks in Rust. So it is, it's take a lot of pain and overhead from your, from your brain as a, as a developer. So it's called real-time um, interrupt-driven, um, oh, sorry, con concurrency. And it was called real time for the masses before. So it's to say how friendly and approachable this library is. So you see it's um, under an attribute. It imports the pack of the, I think I have a cat. Yeah, there. Um, it imports the, the pack of your, of your crate. Then you, you do some import. You, you make a clock that never, that never stops, a monotonic clock. And then the resources are divided between shared and local resources. You, you initialize those there, uh, and then you return the resources, the shared, the local, and the, and the clock. Uh, the clock is used for postponing tasks, and the, the task is really uh, the heart of the system. It's the unit of concurrency. It manages a lot of things for you. It manages the priorities, and it manages uh, the concurrency. So if you need to use resources in a task, if it's shared, you just lock it and it guarantees you deadlock-free execution. And then you do what you have to do with it. And if it's a local task, uh, sorry, local resource that is only going to be used in one task, then you just access it through the context there. And yeah, and you can put priorities as well there. And contrary to C, priority zero is the lowest priority. So good to know for debugging. And yeah, um, another really cool framework is called Embassy, and it utilizes the fact that we can use uh, futures to abstract away this interrupt uh, handling for us, so we can write a synchronous code that flows like synchronous code while still having uh, multitasking abilities, and we can also sleep while things happening waiting for an interrupt and uh, yeah it also this uh, synchronous flow of the of the program makes it really easy to write like non-blocking drivers um, that is not entangled in the control flow of the program so yeah here we have a little example here of running embassy um, it's a uh, ferrous you can see it in real life after this talk. <laughs> we brought some, some uh, toys. Oh, yeah, <laughs> no doom, <laughs> unfortunately. But <laughs> We'll think about that yeah. for next time. <laughs> yeah, so. Oh, yeah. Um, we'll yeah, so just a on. summary about, uh, yeah, so we have, um, like, the buttons to control the little fairies, and then an enum for the status of the buttons, and it's, yeah, it's uh, async await. So we have an async executor, and that is going to control, yeah, so in the main loop, we have a channel, so it's cooperative concurrency, so uh, first in, first out queue. Uh, so we have a, a, yeah, a channel here with a sender, receiver. We initialize every button, then we spawn a function that is going to a button listener for every button. We send um, yeah, the, the sender, the button, that's ID. And so this is the button listener. So you see in a async await style, it just awaits for the pin to go low. Uh, there we wait 50, 25 milliseconds. It's not important. It's just that in embedded systems, when you press a button, you think you press a button, but it's going to have 100 spikes. So you want to debounce that. And then it awaits when the pin is yeah, it sends the ID of the, of the press button, then it awaits for it to go 
to be released, and then it informs that it has been released. And in the main loop, like the infinite loop of embedded systems, we, in a Rust style, we just match on the receiver end of the channel the event, then which ID it was, and then if it was button right, we just move Ferris to the right. Same thing for everything else. And yeah, and then we just clear the screen, draw the image, flush the screen. So this is how it works. And yeah, the key here is the, the await keyword. So uh, even if you want a driver, you, you, you choose a driver that already exists, you rip off the function and make them async. I mean, roughly simplified. Yeah, the most important part, the debugging. So from pain, sweat, tears, blood. So when you have, when you're designing embedded systems, you don't know where the, where the problem is. Is it the software? Is it the hardware? Is it, what can it be? So don't hesitate to change your cables twice. Um, check if you plugged it as you, as you think it is. I mean, breadboard can be tricky. Uh, is the board powered? Are, are you really sure? Because some boards have power, some have not. Uh, do you yet yeah, check that the code that you are running is actually running? You yeah, don't assume anything. Check the data sheet. Check the schematics. Check the errata, because it's the, something the manufacturer publish afterhands when they, oops, they realize they made a oopsie, so check the erratas. Um, a very classical error is to swap uh, receiver and transmitter um, cables when you do, I don't know, some serial protocols. And um, data cables and clock cables can also be, be swapped, so check that. And yeah, they're inverted, like the receiver part has the receive where the sender part are, they send. So don't hesitate to check that. And then also something that, of experience, <laughs> Uh, are all peripherals enabled as you think they are? Are the clocks enabled? Please add some things. Uh, yeah, I <clears throat> covered a lot of good things. I think in general, just never assume anything about your hardware. Always verify and check that it's actually working in real life. Uh, and yeah, <clears throat> more than in any other development, I think it's very important to proceed with baby steps here and just uh, try to never be more than one undo away from something that is working. You just build on top of that. So you might start with this Blinky app and continuously build from that or another working, known working example. Uh, yeah, I think it's um, well, covered a lot of stuff here. Yeah, so. Um... Yeah, to go further, we have lots of trainings uh, in the community at Ferro Systems. We have trainings for NRF52. We have trainings for Espressive that are open source. So they are accessible. Please help yourself do this at home. Yeah, and I also teach an uh, embedded systems design class in Rust in uh, Lirileo University of Technology in Sweden. You can apply for it. Uh, we design a, a project from the ground up doing circuit design, printed circuit boards, and yeah, uh, assembly, uh, assembling the devices and write firmware for it, so the whole chain. And then we, as an examination, we usually play a, we make a, like an optical mouse as for the past two years, that's been the project. And we end this by playing a Counter-Strike tournament using these mice. That's the examination part of this. So you don't need to be in Luleå in Sweden to apply? No, it's, no, it's been remote, so, but yeah. So, and um, yeah. Yeah, thank you. And this is where you can find all the images and uh, the, the, the Doom pictures as well. Yeah, also, I want to, uh, you can also check out our Matrix channels, the, the Rust Embedded Working Group that we're part of. Is, we have meetings every Tuesday night, uh, so come check it out. And we also, the really good community 
Everyone is very helpful and non-gatekeeping. So it's a very good uh, space to be in. Well, thank you, Foss. Thank you.